Hi, I'm Cayman Reynolds, and today I want to talk to you about preserving your combs, what you can do. There's a couple different options out there, and some of these might be illegal for you, so you'll need to check that out if you're thinking about using them. I know in certain countries, Paramoth is, and in certain states, and yes, we're thinking about you, California. Oh boy. Anyways, I'm not saying you need to use this product. This is the first time I've ever used it before. So obviously you can survive without it. It is a little trickier. There's also another product out there, um, which is basically um, a variety of BT. So there's several varieties that is used. I believe it's certified organic in certain places. I don't know that for a fact, but I know there's a lot of different types of BT that is used around the world for organic production in vegetables and fruits. So I imagine that that's the reason a lot of people use it. However, I don't really have a lot of information on that because I've never used that either. But that's an option you can look into. So I'm sure somebody below will probably comment on that. Um, and as far as the Paramoth goes, that's what we're going to be talking about primarily. But we're also going to be talking about how I preserve the combs without it. So obviously a freezer is awesome. The best way to store your combs is on the bees themselves. The bees are really good at that. However, they have to be healthy and strong to be able to do so. And here in Tennessee, it's very mild, so it's very easy for us to leave extra space on the bees. It's not like we leave just all the honey supers on. We, don't, we definitely don't do that. However, when it comes to dry supers, it's very easy to keep them here. So let's start with the dry supers first, and then we're going to talk about the ones that already have a little bit of wax moth damage. We're also going to talk about mice a little bit as well, because those boogers can do a lot of damage to your combs. And everyone you know, gets concerned about having you know, paramoth which, um, you know, it's supposed to outgas. Whenever you do this treatment, if you choose to do it, you need to let them clear out and air out for, I would recommend, at least two weeks. I don't know what the manufacturer is. I don't think it's that long. However, um, just make sure that they off-gas a pretty good bit. But with the dry, let's start with that over here. So the main thing with the dry... I'm not concerned about wax moths with these, but I don't want mice in here because they will literally chew away your frames. If you haven't experienced this, they'll get up in here and build a nest in between everything, and they will literally cut grooves almost the entire bit of the frame, especially if they're put together. They'll cut a really nice chunk out of your frames, which is no good. And then all of your wax and everything smells like mouse fecal matter. Fantastic. All right, these are dry combs right here. And I'm gonna grab a couple of, you know, I'm gonna grab these and I'm gonna show you what I mean by dry comb. Should be pretty easy to understand. How'd that get there? Chicken powder. All right, so here's a, what I would call a wet comb. Now wet combs are often referred to um, supers that have had the honey extracted out of them, but I just, there's dry and then there's stuff that you know, that has material in it, and I just call those wet. So this is mostly bee bread. There's actually no honey at all. I don't know if you can see that in there. There's a little bit of wax moth damage. Yeah, you can see that a little bit in the video. That is a problem. And this is just the beginning stages. However, it's getting really cold. So uh, there's some more damage right there. You can see those trails. And it's probably just a, a couple wax moths doing all that. Maybe three, four, or five, something like that. When it gets really bad, it'll completely destroy your combs. This comb is still perfectly good. The bees will clean this up. They will use this. They will repair the damage. But if allowed to continue, especially if it's warm, we're getting freezing temperatures now, so it's not such a big deal. And that's one thing I wanted to say is that if you have issues like this right now and you are in an area that's constantly below freezing, you probably just need to protect them from mice. Um, and I'll sh you'll see what I do with the dry method. However, if you're in an area that's kind of mild like ours, you might want to go ahead and do something else, but we don't. A little bit of damage like this is okay. I'm not concerned about it. This is a dry comb right here. This one had honey in it, and there's nothing in it. No bee bread, no honey, nothing. And many people don't seem to know when they're getting into beekeeping that wax moss, hive beetle larvae, bears... That it's all about the fats and proteins. It's really not about the honey. I mean, the honey is just an added bonus. But really, the pollens have all the large macro and micro minerals that the creatures need to be able to develop appropriately. The proteins, the fats, are also important. Honey doesn't 
have a lot of those things, has very little um, of any of those things. It's an energy source for sure, and man, it is good. But the beetles and the wax moss and the bears and all of those things that try to get into the hives are all about brood, protein, and bee bread, all that stuff. And if you can have a little dessert with it, fantastic. So we need to make sure that these are protected right here. And the only way we're going to be able to do that, especially from the mice. Now, the mice don't really get in here for the foodstuffs as much. I have seen where it looks like they've eaten some of the bee bread. But it seems primarily they're just in here for a nice cozy spot for winter. And that's just not allowed. So you'll want to also put some reducers on your colony. But a lot of people seem to think that wax moths just want wax. And that's not the case at all. Wax moths actually do very little damage to no damage in combs like this, especially if they are aired out good. And, and I'm not saying you have airflow just constantly blowing through here or anything special, but basically when we store a dry comb like this, all we're doing, what we have underneath here, keep interrupt, interrupting myself, what we're doing is just giving it some ventilation. So we got a excluder down here. Now you don't have to use excluders for this. You can go to the hardware store, get eighth inch hardware cloth, you need something that's going to be able to withstand mice chewing through it because they will chew through the vinyl slash plastic window screen material. You can get this type of, it's basically like window screen, but it's metal and the mice aren't going to be able to chew through that. But if you get the cheap plastic stuff, which is, you know, that stuff's cheap too, but the other stuff's a lot cheaper, mice can chew through that no problem. But you can put that at the bottom, get a little bit of ventilation, and another thing that I like to do, which I've got one of them in my hand right now, is instead of having 10 in a box like this or 9, I really like having 8 in a box. This ensures that there's a lot of airflow between the frames. There's um, also sunlight or a little daylight coming through the top because we don't put a lid on top. We just put an excluder like this or one of those screens on top. And again, we're protecting it from the mice. We're also allowing plenty of air to get through here. Now keep in mind, if you want to, you can use something like this and those wax moths won't be able to fly in here. But that won't necessarily keep them from getting out, uh, getting in, because the wax moths can lay eggs at the edges of, of things. And of course, they'll just start burrowing from there and working their way inward. So when you do it like this, it doesn't mean you're not going to get any damage at all, but it's extremely minimal. We'll, we'll see probably one or two little tunnels in these combs. No big deal. Doesn't bother me a bit. This has worked for me for well over a decade. And you know, when I first got into beekeeping, I was really concerned about all this stuff because, you know, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose all my combs. And let me tell you, these combs are valuable, extremely valuable. I would rather have 10 hives with all the comb that I needed and have strong hives than to have strong hives with no comb at all. Now in different areas where you have super long flows and you're in one of those like one percentile areas in the world where you have these long flows and long seasons, combs may not be as valuable to you. But there's a lot of us that have very short seasons and you've got to get combs while you can get them. It can take several years for a new beekeeper to build up and Combs help keep your colonies from wanting to swarm so much. They helps you make splits a whole lot easier, easier and all that stuff. Now, eventually, when you get to a certain size, you're going to want to cycle boxes out. But I would rather have too many combs than, than to not. So I really am not one of those guys that cycles them out every three to five years. If I need to, I'll keep them for ten years. Never seen an issue. We get inspected. I just send a thing off to the University of Maryland. No brood diseases. You know, there's always minimal parts per million, but, you know, nothing of that's substantial or anything like that. But then again, we have a pretty close environment here. We take care of our bees and we do what we need to. And so I think there's a little bit of play there. So let's get more into the paramoss side of things. So, again, that's all we really do here. We just want to make sure that there's ventilation, there's a little daylight coming through. You can stack these up. You know, me, I can only go up so high without getting a step ladder. So if you're ambitious and taller, you can probably get away with more. But seriously, you can you can stack these up and just have all kinds of rows of these things going. And you know, if you you could probably um put a spritz or two of essential oil on top, and you know, apparently that's um that works good for everything these days. So maybe that'll help 
keep the moss away, all that kind of stuff. Maybe deter the mice, but definitely the mice are my biggest concern with those kind of things. And, and with these as well. Keep in mind, most of these combs have been sitting out in the shed, even in warmer weather, for a month or so. I'm getting 60 degree days, dropping down pretty cold. So you can see a little bit of damage here. Just all this protein, it's got to be, you know, it's just got to be dealt with. Now, you could stick this in the freezer. And if you have room, that's the best way to deal with it. Sticking these in the freezer is not going to damage them at all. Just make sure they thaw out really good. You know, give it about 24 hours, I would say, before you introduce it into a colony. And that way they'll have some nice resources and all kinds of stuff. It takes a, I think it takes a couple days, though, before it'll actually kill the wax moss. That might have already laid eggs and stuff in there. But again, if you introduce it to a big colony, they'll kick their butt and take their name. So, now let's get to the paramoth stuff. Alright, so you've seen combs like that. Now, we also, at certain times of the year, have all of our, like these dry combs right here, they had all kinds of honey in them, just, you know, little remnants after extracting. And you can set the boxes back onto the colonies, and, you know, within just a you know day, you just pull it back off, and, and then they're dry. The bees have sucked everything out of it. And, you know, in some areas, it is legal to open feed, um, well, open feed your supers, basically, you extract them, take them out, and then the bees feed them out, and that'll also dry them out. Whenever you're doing that, you're not legally allowed to do that here in Tennessee, but in other places you are allowed to. They do that because they don't want anyone spreading diseases around, but again, that's, that's legal in some areas and it's not in others. But whenever you're feeding like that, if you don't want them to damage your combs a lot, you need to probably stagger them to eight a, in a, a deep box, and that way the bees have plenty of room to get down in there and, and get to the cells easily. And I would, when I'm, you know, doing anything like that, um, like say I accidentally leave one out. Um, I've had that happen this year where I left a whole box of like honey with a an edge exposed. We were supposed to be taking them in the extraction room, and by the time I realized that there was a hole in the box, there was like four pounds of bees in there. Too late at that point, really. And they'd already gotten to about a third of it. So what I did, and if you're going to do that. You'll need to stagger your frames because the bees will fight so much to get to that honey, they'll actually cut into the wax and they'll make really big divots, divots in your comb just trying to get to what they can, you know, fighting for it. Again, that's not legal here to do that. So, anyways, I'm eventually going to get to this over here, I promise. Laurel's looking at me like, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> well, I guess I was talking too much. She cut me off. Not the first time. Anyways, so... Getting to the paramount side of things. So, again, this is a personal choice. I really feel like once it gets really cold outside and you get a lot of freezing temps, it's you can just basically do what I did here. But what happens if you have a bunch in summer? And see, I always have kind of colonies I can put resources on. I'm always making splits. So frames of bee bread like that, if I'm making a split, I'll give that to the colony. I'll take one of their foundations or dry combs out or something. It's getting more tricky the bigger that we get. Um, you know, we're, we're growing a lot in, in the last couple of years, and because of that, we're expanding our apiary, and we're always needing more combs. Eventually, you get to the point where you stop, okay, I'm going to stop at five hives, 500 hives, whatever it is, and you start building up that comb reservoir, which is awesome, and then you end up having this comb that you have to store, and that's when things get tricky. So I want to look into that BT stuff and a few other options, and, and I'll be updating you guys as we experiment more with those things, and, you know, we're, we're still learning a lot of stuff ourselves. So, But if you're wanting to use a Paramoth product, so one of the things you've got to do is take your hive tool, and you're going to want to get any propolis that is on the edges of these boxes and scrape that down to where they meet up as best as possible. We have at the bottom of this, we have one of our flat migratory lids, and then we have this bottom box encased in a trash bag, you know, getting really fancy there. Now, when you're using the Paramoth, I'm sure it doesn't matter how many combs are in each box. So we have 10 in all those other boxes here. We're fixing to throw these back into here. And now they recommend on the instructions that you use for five deep boxes, which would translate to like 10 mediums. 
that you use three ounces of Paramoth crystals or um, I think that's six tablespoons. Yeah, six tablespoons. So I didn't put that much on here. Now technically you're supposed to have um, safety glasses on so don't get this in your eye and, and gloves and stuff but I'm a careful person mostly. It's my middle name. Came in carefully. Uh, anyway so there's the crystals just sitting right there. We're going to want to take this tape and we're going to want to seal all of these up. So we're going to be going around that. I'm not going to show you everything. I think most of you all know how to put tape on. So I think you all can figure that out. But just use some tape like this. Go around the edges here. We're wanting to make sure that stays in there. You can come back later and recheck this. And that's why I didn't put as much as normal. I'm going to come back here in a little while. And plus it's going to be winter time. That's the thing. When I keep them like this, I don't keep them through summer or spring when it's hot. So I don't have to worry about wax moss that much. I promise you these boxes will be on colonies by March. You know, bees are busting out of the seams in March if they're healthy. And they're going to need space. And definitely by April they're going to need more room. And we're making splits and all kinds of stuff at that point. So now we want something that's going to give us a little bit of headspace up here. So that's where our feeder rims come into play. So we'll want to put some tape around that. And then we're going to take another trash bag. Or, you know, you don't have to use a trash bag. You can just get a piece of plastic and tape it down, put a lid on top of that, and that kind of thing. So there's really not a whole lot to that. This product right here is totally different from mothballs, though. I mean, it's, it's kind of a relative, but mothballs um, is a, you know, still pretty different, and it'll leave um, harmful residues and stuff. It's not good to be put around your comb, so don't use mothballs. This is designed for this stuff. And, I mean, it's been used for many, many, many decades. And I've never heard of anything negative coming out of it. I know a lot of people don't like it because, you know, it's a chemical. However, it works whether you like it or not. That's just kind of the way things are. Um, you know, the, I, I, sounds like we have another satisfied customer here at Tennessee's Bees. So it's time to cut this video short. If I missed anything... Yep, we covered everything. Um, I gotta go take care of the, that guy. Um, thanks for watching the video.